Most of you have heard of Christopher Nolan. The, uh, the famous director up on the screen is a collage of some of the, the films that he's done. You'll see movies like, uh, like Tenet, not the, not the media company, uh, Interstellar, uh, Oppenheimer, Inception, and probably my favorite, uh, perhaps his, his, the, the best films he's ever created, uh, the Dark Knight trilogy. Uh, these are, of course, the, the Batman movies that he did with, uh, with, with uh, Christian Bale. Now, uh, Nolan actually says, and you see it already on the screen here, Nolan actually says that his, his proudest cinematic uh, moment in, in film ever was this opening scene of The Dark Knight, the, uh, the Dark Knight Rises, the final film in that trilogy. And uh, as mentioned, it's already up on the screen, but uh, in the opening uh, portion of, of this scene, it introduces this main villain named Bane. And Bane is kind of this uh, uh, quirky guy who is kind of uh, a psychotic and he really, really hates Batman. And so the, the film starts with uh, this nuclear scientist who's been rescued by this local militia. And, and they're meeting, they're rendezvousing with these CIA officers who they're, they're handing over this, this nuclear scientist to. Uh, but with them are these three hooded prisoners, uh, these three additional uh, captives. And they tell, this local militia tells this, this, uh, this CIA, uh, this agent and these CIA officers that these, these prisoners worked for the masked mercenary Bane. And they were trying to capture the scientist. And since Bane was on the, uh, the, the America's Most Wanted list or, or something, the CIA decides to take him too, or, or these, these prisoners as well, as well as, the, as well as the nuclear scientist. And so they all get up on this, uh, they all get up on this little plane, they kind of take off, and on the plane, this, this lead officer starts interrogating these prisoners. And he's asking them questions. Uh, he's trying to extract information out of them. And uh, suddenly, one of the prisoners is very intriguing to this officer. And so he rips his, his hood off of uh, this prisoner, and he realizes that it's Bane himself. And uh, in, in the moment, uh, all these thoughts kind of race, must be racing through this, uh, this, this, this agent's mind. And he blurts out, he says, was getting caught part of your plan. And Bane, of course, answers kind of in his, his funny voice, of course. <laughs> and he mocks him a little bit. And then all of a sudden, and it's, this is just an epic scene, all of a sudden, this little plane that they're all on, the, the camera pans up and you see this larger plane hovering above the little plane. And, and all of a sudden, these soldiers that are loyal to Bane start literally midair rappelling down this, this large plane to execute the plane. And it's such, a, it's such an amazing scene. They rip the plane open. They, they rescue the scientists. They rescue Bane. And pretty much everybody else dies on board. And they stage the, uh, the event to look like, like a crash. Now, it's an amazing scene, not only because of the, the actual filming and the soundtrack score uh, and the lines, but it's also a great opening scene because it introduces this villain, Bane, because of how it introduces him, because of how it puts him forward. It introduces him as this meticulous planner, this meticulous planner who's willing to get caught who's willing to, to hijack a plane midair and just about do anything and everything that it takes to accomplish his goals, his plans, no matter what. He's introduced as this villain who has absolute control over his environment. Absolute control. Now, why do I mention all of this <laughs> this morning? <laughs> because we're going to see in our passage... Through our passage, we're going to be up close and personal with someone who actually does have absolute control. Someone who actually does have absolute authority over his environment. Not Bane, but Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the meticulous planner. The one who could answer the question this morning, was getting caught part of your plan? Of course. The one who was willing to crash, not others, but himself, ultimately to accomplish his goal. 
his plan from the Father, our salvation. Some of you this morning may feel like your life is filled with setbacks, with disappointments, with broken plans, with frustrated timelines. But what if in this fallen world, what if in this broken world that we live in, God is absolutely sovereign? What if God is absolutely in control? What if nothing ever happens that he first doesn't allow or even perhaps cause? What if God, what if God is grieving with us when sin and evil and hardship and setback happens in our life? But what if he is so in control? What if he is so in control that he is working out all things for the good of those who love him and who've been called according to his purpose. This morning in the Garden of Gethsemane, we'll see the ultimate example that this is the kind of God that we have. When what seems like the greatest disappointment, the greatest setback, the greatest broken plan, Jesus Christ, the righteous one, getting arrested, heading to a cross, God remains totally in control. He is in all of that. He is entering into the pain. He says, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down according to my own will. He's going to feel all the pain, all the feels, because in the the long run, he's working out something for our good. The main idea of this passage, a very famous passage, is simple this morning, and it's this. God is is in control. Jesus Christ is in control. Many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. My main points are going to be up on the screen. They're going to flow from this passage, and they're this. Number one, betrayal and sovereignty. Number two, restlessness and surrender. Number three, weakness and trust. The first word in each point are all actions, all possibilities of things that can happen when we reject the sovereignty of God, when we reject that God has absolute authority, that he's absolutely in control, when we reject that God is working out all things for our good. We can betray him like Judas because he doesn't meet our expectations, doesn't fit our plans, or perhaps we can get anxious and begin to take things into our own hands like Peter when God doesn't fit into our timeline. And as we'll see, Peter part two, we can lose heart. We can lose faith in moments when following Jesus looks like a dead end. So let's kind of dive in here to the first point. Jesus has just finished up with his disciples. He's been in the upper room, and the upper room is often called the Last Supper. This is his last chance that he's had to to prepare his disciples in his earthly life for what they would be faced with, what they were called to do. And the text says, we'll pick up in verse 1, when Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the brook Kidron, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now, Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, For Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. So Jesus leaves the upper room, and with his disciples, he crosses this stream, and he goes to one of his favorite spots, a garden, the Garden of Gethsemane. And the disciples are probably thinking, it's been been stuffy, it's been hot in this upper room, Uh, knowing Jesus, we're going to go to a place to pray. But Jesus knows Judas' next move. Getting caught here is part of the plan. Now notice Judas here also has a a, a large pack with him, probably 200 Roman soldiers and a couple of dozen religious officers, it says, from the chief priest's office. They have lanterns, they have torches, they have weapons. Most of the religious people in Jerusalem have had enough of Jesus. Uh, Things are at a boiling point with him. Things are at a a tipping point with him. And so Judas thinks he's bringing him in. But Jesus has 
set the trap. Verse 4, Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? Notice in this moment, Jesus is completely in control. He sees the pack just outside the garden, and he's not caught off guard at all. He's not taken by surprise. He's not adjusting his plans in the moment. This is exactly the plan. And so it's dark, and he probably just kind of walks outside of the garden and and raises his voice a little bit, and he projects it and says, hey, who are you all looking for? He's not going to make this hard. He's so focused on the will of God. He's so focused on the will of the Father. And notice in verse 5, they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. That is the guy who they think can't be the Messiah, the guy with the wrong accent, the guy from the wrong part of town, the wrong class, the guy who breaks their wise living rules. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Now talk about being, <laughs> talk about being in control. Talk about being the Messiah. Jesus says, I am he, and a bunch of them, maybe all of them, just fall. They lose their footing. You think at this moment that they would be done, but there's probably a lot of confusion happening in this moment. Hindsight is, is 2020, we might say. It's dark. It's tense. And the soldiers that fell probably don't fully understand what just happened. They're probably more stunned in this moment than amazed or or panicked. But what Jesus has just done, what Jesus has just done really here, is his last openly, overtly powerful, miraculous thing in his earthly life. And what has he done? Well, he showed them who he truly is. He showed them who he truly is. And who is he? Well, he says... I am he. I am he. Now, in our English Bibles, they have to say I am he for readability purposes, for intelligibility purposes. But in the original Greek, that word he is not there. The text literally reads ego amy. Ego amy. And what that means is I am. I am. They say we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. We're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus responds literally, I am. I am. It's echoing here what what God says to Moses in Exodus. When Moses encounters God, God responds. He tells him who he is. God tells Moses who he is, and he says, I am who I am. And like every person, whether it's Ezekiel or Isaiah or John, who gets a glimpse of God, their legs turn to jelly. They fall over and die. They completely lose their footing. Every religious founder that's ever stepped on the face of the map has come and says, I have come to show you the way to God. But Jesus Christ comes here and he says, I am, I am, I am God in the flesh come for you. And in this moment, he decides just a little bit, just a tiny smidgen to reveal his glory to this little band of soldiers. And in that moment, it knocks this legion on their face. Apparently those that fell get up, and verse 7 proceeds, so he asked them again, whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. Of those whom you gave me, I have lost not one. There's confusion, there's panic, there's a lot going on, And and Jesus yet is fully in control. He's always in control. And he says, you got me. But he says, please let them go. It's notable that even in the midst of betrayal, even in the midst of his, his darkest moment, his primary concern is faithfulness to the Father. His primary concern is to not lose one that the Father has given him. Now, Judas ultimately betrayed Jesus really because of two things, and I've mentioned this before. He betrayed Jesus because of two things. Number one was disbelief. Disbelief. As you read through the Gospels, Judas never refers to Jesus as Lord. It's always rabbi or teacher. It's never Lord, because in his heart, he doesn't believe that Jesus is the Son of God. He never knew him. So number one, disbelief. But number two is disillusionment disillusionment. Judas is completely discontent with Jesus Christ. 
He believed that the real Savior, a real Messiah, would overthrow Rome. That a real Savior would come and would give him earthly things. He believed that coming to Christ, coming to church, Christianity would give him something. Power, relationships, comfort, freedom, something. And that something ultimately wasn't God. It wasn't Jesus. It was all wrapped up in this life. His hope, Judas's hope, was misplaced. And even up to this last moment, where God is fully in control, he cannot see God's plan happening in front of his eyes in any way. His disillusionment, his discontentment, his disbelief, his unchecked desire for comfort and power in relationships is blinding him where he cannot see the great I am. This morning, a good question for us is your hope ultimately in Jesus Christ. Is it in knowing him? Is it in experiencing his salvation, growing deeper in relationship with him? Can you say with the Apostle Paul, I want to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, becoming like him in death? If you shift your hope, if you shift your expectations to something less than that, or if your expectations have always been something less than that and God doesn't give it to you, you're in danger of missing it, of missing the God who is absolutely sovereign and for you and with you, who has gone beyond just grieving and relating with us, but has actually stepped into our situation and died for us, has clothed himself in flesh and taken on the justice and punishment that we deserve. If you shift your hope, if your expectation is less than that, less than knowing him, experiencing him, you're in danger of missing it. The passage goes on and we see our second point, restlessness and surrender. Restlessness and surrender. Verse 10, then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus has offered himself up. Getting caught is part of the plan. And as this big pack of soldiers starts to come towards him, Peter, stubborn Peter, impulsive Peter, he doesn't like the plan. Peter thinks this plan is weak. He thinks Jesus needs protection. He feels it in himself. Someone needs to take charge. Someone needs to take action. This is his moment. And so in the middle of all the commotion, when the, when the guys are still trying to get back up on their feet, when all the eyes are on Jesus, in the dark, Peter pulls his sword. It's probably a smaller sword, and he risks it all. He tries to take the head off of this guy, Malchus, the high priest's servant, but his aim's not great, so he gets only his ear. And so quite immediately, Jesus turns to him and says, put your sword down. What are you doing? What are you doing? Verse 11, shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? And the other gospels say that probably just as fast as he rebukes Peter, as he corrects Peter, he reaches out to Malchus, he puts his hand on his ear, and he heals him. There you go, Peter. No evidence, <laughs> just in case anyone saw him. In other words, Peter says, I don't like this plan. This doesn't fit into my plan. Time to take things into my own hands. And Jesus says, Peter, stop. This is the plan. It may not make sense to you, but this is the plan. I have to drink the cup that the Father has given to me. Now, Jesus is so, so, so patient with Peter. Peter has been in graduate school with Jesus for three years now, directly under Jesus Christ. And Jesus has been telling him about this moment over and over and over again that he didn't come to rule, but that he came to die. He didn't come to pick up the sword, he came to give his life. That he's going to be betrayed, that, that he's going to die. And yet what we find is Peter just cannot accept that. He likes Jesus a lot, but he just can't process this. It, it, it just doesn't go in his brain. And so he reminds him here once again, Jesus is so, so patient. He reminds him here once again, that he has to drink the cup that the Father has given to him. Now, what is the cup? What is the cup? Well, all throughout the, the, the Old Testament, the cup is a judgment day thing. 
all throughout the Old Testament, the cup is, is a judgment day thing. The, the cup is what God's going to make the tyrants drink. The cup is what God's going to make the, the oppressors drink on judgment day. The cup is suffering. The, the cup is punishment. The cup is judgment. It's justice. On judgment day, all the evildoers, God says, are going to drink the cup. But Jesus says here that he has to drink the cup. He has to drink the cup that the Father has given to him. That the Father has given to him. Now this, notice, really is the heart of the Christian faith. This is the heart of the entire plan of God. This really is the thing that Jesus is focused on accomplishing no matter what, to drink the cup that the Father has given him. This is the goal. And on the cross, Jesus goes and he drinks the cup, the full cup of the Father's wrath. The all-loving God also must be an all-just God. At the cross, Jesus Christ takes the judgment that you and I deserve for our sin. Our sin falls on him. Everything you deserve, everything I deserve falls on him. He goes into the fire for you and I. Today, secularism essentially says there is no judgment day, and so all these injustices are never going to be resolved. And today, we might say traditional religion says there will be a judgment day, that the judge is here, so you better be a good person. But the gospel says there's going to be a judgment day, but the judge came to earth and was judged in our place. Jesus Christ is the judge who was judged. Why? Because he loved us so much that he drank the cup of the wrath of God because he didn't want to lose any of us that the Father had given to him. He's reminding Peter again. He says he's, he's come to do something. And the plan might seem weak. It might be seemingly filled with broken roads. It might not make any sense. But out of the ashes, he's going to bring something beautiful, something good, ultimate deliverance, ultimate redemption. This is the kind of God that we have, a God who is completely in control and who asks you to trust him this morning with broken roads, with plans that don't often make sense, to not ultimately take things into your own hands, but out of the ashes, knowing that he can bring good that he can bring life, that he can bring light. Hasn't he already proven that on the cross? The passage continues and we see our third and final point this morning, weakness and trust. Verse 12, so the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. The passage goes on to say that they led him to Annas, the father-in-law of the high priest, who was the high priest that year, verse 15. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest, but Peter stood outside at the door. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. The other disciple is likely John, the writer of this gospel. The band of soldiers is essentially taking Jesus to a secure area. John has the badge. John has the, the clearance. He has the connection to slip in. Peter doesn't, and so he talks to the girl. He says, hey, can my buddy come in? And he comes in. Now, Jesus' trial has already started. It's, it's late at night. It's cold, and so Peter finds a fire to warm himself up around. And at that fire are some of those soldiers warming themselves up. Some time goes on in verse 17. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, you also are not one of the man's disciples, are you? He said, I'm not. Maybe it's a casual setting. Maybe, maybe people are staring into the fire. Maybe some people are sitting. Maybe some people are standing. Maybe some of the jokes are flying. But she asks him, you're not with Jesus, are you? And he says, nope. Some time goes on, verse 25. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself, so they said to him, you also are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I'm not. He says, nope, not again. Then verse 26, one of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter again denied it. 
and at once a rooster crowed. Nope, the third time, of course, the three denials of Christ. Peter's become what we might call a chameleon here. He's, he's absolutely intimidated by the social situation that he's found himself in. And here he's, he's afraid of what they're going to think about him or what they'll do to him because of his connection to Jesus. In this moment, his heart loves Jesus, but his mind is telling him this is a dead end. He's run out of courage. He's run out of conviction. His faith really isn't there. Because ultimately, he is unsure if Jesus Christ really is in control. And so he starts sizing up the social situation, how it's going, where it's going, and he caves. He thinks that God is not fully in control over the situation, so he needs to be in control. And so in this moment, self-preservation becomes the goal. Comfort becomes the goal. Being a silent disciple becomes the best tactical option. And just like Jesus told him, you're, you're going to deny me three times and the rooster will crow. And of course, that rooster crows. Now, just like Peter, sometimes your heart can love Jesus, but your mind can tell you that following him is a dead end. You can believe that he's great, but you can start to be unsure if he's really in control. And so self-preservation becomes the goal. Comfort becomes the goal. Being a silent disciple becomes the best tactical option. And the rooster crows. But I want to remind you this morning, following Jesus Christ is never a dead end. It may be the death of the life you thought you wanted, but it's the beginning of the life that you never knew you truly needed. Trust him today. He's in control. He's in control of every moment of your life. Trust that he's working out all things for good, for the good of those who love him and who've been called according to his purpose. I don't know about you, but if you've ever really planned something and it goes wrong, it can be really frustrating. You put a lot of time a lot of energy, a lot of thought into something. You have your dream of how it's going to look and how it's going to feel. And sometimes things go wrong. Sometimes things go really wrong. Uh, my entire month of August was largely like this. Uh, what I thought would be a, a peaceful flight into to Florida was, was wrecked as uh, the plane slid through the sky as we flew into Hurricane Debbie. A few weeks later, our church's mission trip to Southeast Asia was canceled because of the political climate in that country. And just last week, our faith night was postponed last minute because of lightning that never really showed up. <laughs> I don't know about you, but if you've ever really planned something and and it goes wrong, it can be really frustrating. You put a lot of time and thought and energy into something. You have your dream of how it's going to, to be, how it's going to look and feel, and sometimes things go wrong. Sometimes things go really wrong. But what if God is actually in control of everything? What if the proverb is true that many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. What if in this fallen world, what if in this broken world, God is absolutely sovereign and absolutely in control of everything, that nothing ever happens apart from him allowing it or even him causing it? What if God is grieving with us when evil and setback and sin happens, but is so in control, so in control that in the long run, he's working out all things for our good. It's helpful to remember as we, as we study this passage, this is not the first time that the Lord was betrayed in a garden. In Genesis, the first book of the Bible, it tells us that in the garden, God had planned something. He put a lot of time and a lot of thought 
and a lot of energy into something and in a very real sense had a vision, had a dream of how it would look and how it would feel. And yet things go really wrong. Really, really wrong. God is betrayed in a garden. His character doubted. His word twisted. And yet God remains in control of everything. Many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. In this fallen world, he remains absolutely sovereign, absolutely in control of everything. Nothing happens that he doesn't allow. And in this moment, in that moment, God grieves with us in the garden. But because he's so in control and so good, he has the long game in mind. He makes a promise there that one day he's going to redeem the whole situation. He'll work all things for good. From the offspring of Eve, he'll crush the head of the serpent. He'll undo the work of the snake, the devil. And thousands and thousands and thousands of years go by. And this morning, we found ourselves in another garden where once again, God himself is completely in control and has been in control with the long game in mind. Jesus Christ, God with us, has come again to a garden. And God himself once again is betrayed in a garden. His character doubted, his word twisted. And yet he is in control of everything. In this fallen world, he remains absolutely sovereign, absolutely in control. Nothing happens that he doesn't allow. And in this moment, Jesus Christ grieves once again at that garden. All the evil, all the setback, all the sin. But now everything is in place. The hour has come. The promise that the crushing of the head of the serpent, undoing the work of the devil, it's finally here. And yet nothing seems like it's going according to God's plan. To the disciples, all the time, all the energy, all the effort into following Jesus is coming to an end. But notice God is in it for the long game. He's only just beginning. Resurrection is coming. In this fallen world, God is completely in control. He's absolutely sovereign this morning. Trust Him. When your plans seem to go wrong, when things get frustrated, do you believe that he's in control? When the God of the universe is unfairly hauled off in chains and arrested and killed, do you believe he's in control? Trust him today. His ways are higher than our ways. As one pastor said, God is too good to be unkind and he's too wise to be mistaken. And when we cannot trace his hand, we must trust his heart. Trust him today. He's good. His mercies endure forever. If you would, pray with me. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this great passage that reminds us uh, of your control, of your, your good power over all things. Lord, that you are the creator of the heavens and the earth, that we can trust you. Lord, that you've given your son for us, that we might live, that we might be forgiven, that we would be able to rest in you, to trust you, the God who is making all things new. Lord, we love you and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 